Well, hello, hello, everybody. Praise the Lord. It is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. And that, of course, means it is time for our midweek Bible study. We greet you this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ from uh, Decatur, Alabama, as part of our work that we've begun here in Huntsville, the um, Forward Christian Life Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we are excited, I'm excited, about this week's Bible study. I do want to tell you right off the starting line, um, I'm kind of rearranging things a little bit. Last week we talked about the law and the role of the law, the nature of the law, you know, so on and so forth, because when you study passages from Leviticus and Deuteronomy and so on and so forth, the Old Testament, it's really important that you have a legitimate grasp of the law. What is the law and what role does it play, etc. Now, I had thought that this week we would move right into some of the Old Testament passages that are commonly used to condemn LGBT people and what have you. However, uh, during the week I've been contemplating this a lot, and I felt like we actually needed to take a slightly different direction. Um, I was going to look at some of these passages and then afterwards look at the role of the death penalty um, as it is described in some of these passages. However, I thought about it and contemplated it, and I thought, wouldn't it really be better if people had an understanding of this issue first? Then when we read these passages, Again, just like understanding the law itself, you will have a very different, very clear understanding of how things worked, okay? So, we are going to look today instead at the role of capital punishment within the context of the Hebrew law, the law of Moses as it is commonly referred to, and whether you are straight gay uh, whatever your situation may be, please stay with us. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there is so much wonderful information and enlightenment to be gleaned from this study tonight that whoever you are, whatever background you come from, you will be inspired and encouraged and educated and uh, you're going to walk away from this Bible study feeling good. I promise you that. I know I will. All right, before we begin our study tonight, as always, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer and then we're going to dive right in. We have a lot of territory to cover. I'm going to try to get it all done in 90 minutes. So let's open with prayer today. Father, we love you, God, and as always, we thank you for every opportunity that we are given to study the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful divine document. Those of us who understand the Bible in truth understand that it is, in fact, a love letter from heaven. Lord, so many walk around under a cloud uh, that they need not walk under. And it's all because this glorious book has been perverted and twisted and made to say things that in reality it does not say. And many walk around, quite frankly, in utter ignorance. And Master, tonight we desire that the Spirit of God would open our minds, open our hearts, help us, not only to hear what is said, but to receive it, to digest it, and Lord, to use it for our spiritual benefit. Anoint the teacher tonight, oh God, help me to speak the word of God, to speak the truth of God. 
Lord, so that those who are bound and oppressed might be liberated by the truth. For the word of God declares, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. We ask all this tonight in none other than the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right. We want to look tonight at the role of the death penalty. Uh, there are a couple of passages that are commonly used against LGBT people that refer to the death penalty. There are many um, ignorant and foolish. I'm going to say it plain, folks, because y'all know me. If you know anything, you know me. I don't have time to mince words. There are some really stupid people out there who call themselves Christians who run around saying, well, the Bible says homosexuals ought to be killed. The Bible says no such thing. No, not even close to that. And I get so tired of ignorant and stupid people. You know, I told one individual at Rocket City Pride a couple weekends ago, uh, I believe it was a transgendered lady who had come by our little booth there. And uh, I told her, I said, you know, the most ignorant people are usually the loudest. And this is one reason why this ministry, I've been doing this now for 30 years, that one reason why this ministry has gone out of its way, why we, I've gone out of my way, I, I saying we is really just gratuitous, because I, I've been doing it long before I met Tommy even, but I've gone out of my way to make our voice heard online in as many locations as I can. We're on as many websites. We have outreach on every conceivable social network that there is. And the reason that I do this and the reason that I've done this over the years is because I know that the most ignorant people are usually the loudest. And unfortunately, the loudest are usually the ones that are heard. So if I'm going to combat the ignorance and the stupidity and the foolishness that's out there, then we have to really try to saturate the market. You know, we, we need to really saturate uh, the Internet so that our teaching and our preaching is available to as wide an audience as possible. This, again, is why I invite people and ask people, share our videos, by all means, if you're able, share our videos, you know, like our videos on uh, YouTube and on Facebook, hit the little thumbs up or the star or whatever it is, the heart, um, but please, because all of these little efforts on your part will help us to get that video out to a much wider, much broader audience. And what we're teaching and what we're preaching needs to get out. So now we've got ignorant people in the fundamentalist evangelical Christian camp who are running around claiming that uh, the Old Testament law calls for um, homosexuals, you know, wholesale to be uh, stoned or to be killed, uh, and we want to address that, okay? What does the Bible, what does the law teach? First of all, if, let's go back a minute, just real quick. First of all, if you're going to um, recite the law, and you're going to try to bring the law into the New Testament era, According to the Word of God, not, not Charles, according to the Word of God, according to the Apostle Paul, to be more direct, and the Apostle Paul was one of the most profoundly uh, educated Jewish men uh, who became part of the apostolic uh, foundation of the church. In other words, Paul knew the law better than anybody knew the law. He knew it better than Peter. He knew it better than John and Matthew and, and any of them, okay? And according to the Apostle Paul, 
if you are going to try to embrace a point of the law, if you're going to claim that, well, the law says thus and so, and therefore we ought to do thus and so, the minute you do that, you become accountable to the entire law, every word of it. So these ignorant and foolish so-called Christians who are running around saying, you know, well, the Bible says, blah, 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 blah. they're trying to um, suggest that the law still stands and that we still are bound by the law and we ought to do things according to the mandate of the law. And the minute you do that, the Apostle Paul said, listen to me, folks, Paul said, you're no longer under grace. The minute you do that, you're no longer under grace. You are now bound by the law. And when you're bound by the law, there is no such thing as big law, little law, big sin, little sin. You are bound to every single point of the law. So that means these Christians who are running around saying this foolishness are going to stand before God, and it's going to happen. And the Lord is going to say, okay, you wanted to use the law as a measure for others, and that means that you don't believe grace is sufficient and faith is sufficient for salvation. Therefore, I'm going to judge you by the same standard that I am going to judge the Jewish people, and that is according to the measure of the law. Um, did you leave the hair on the side of your head uncut when you married? Did you leave your beard untrimmed and unshaven? Did you eat shellfish? Did you work on the Sabbath? And all of these rules, every single one of them are going to be applied to that individual, okay? So for those of you who run around feeling condemned and feeling terrible because there are people saying this foolishness, just consider what I'm telling you now. They are bringing a heap of hellfire and brimstone, as it were, down on their own head when it comes to judgment time, okay? The Old Testament law concerning the death penalty the death penalty, first of all, is not a measure by any stretch of the imagination. Does the death penalty, according to the Old Testament Mosaic Law, imply or suggest that that particular offense is of such a grave and weighty nature that it requires the death penalty? No. Not at all. Let me read to you. First of all, there are a number of matters within the law that call for the death penalty. Oftentimes you'll hear teachers and preachers say that there were 20 items of the law. But that isn't true. And the reason that isn't true they like to group together sometimes uh, different things. But the reason that isn't true is because God's law, like I was saying last week, is so specific that if it says a man shall not do this or else they should be stoned, then it means a man cannot do that. does not mean that the same punishment applies to a woman who might do the same thing. No, the law of God that was given to Moses by the Lord on Mount Sinai was extremely specific. So in reality, there are many more than 20 points of law that called for the death penalty. I'm going to go down the list real quick. Adultery. Uh, in Leviticus 20, 10 through 12, both the man and the woman committing adultery. So, so Donald Trump would already be dead. Okay, he'd already be dead. 
because according to the word of God, adultery, the man and the woman committing adultery were to die. Lying about virginity, a woman lying about her virginity. If she gets married, and in fact she is not a virgin when she marries, but she claimed that she was, believe it or not, according to the law, that was punishable by death. Um, having sexual intercourse with a virgin who is engaged to another man was punishable by law. The practice of a... Uh, of uh, prostitution by the daughter of a priest. You can find that in uh, Leviticus 21.9. That was punishable by law, uh, excuse me, by death. Uh, also, making love to a virgin, that was Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24. Lying about your virginity was Deuteronomy 22, 20 through 21. <coughs> raping someone who is engaged uh, was punishable by law, Deuteronomy 22, 25. Men practicing bestiality. Both the animal and the man were to die, Leviticus 20, 15. Now listen, women practicing bestiality. See, the Lord literally, had, and you say, well, why is that so important? Well, you're going to find out why it's so important when we look at the passage that says, a man shall not lie down with a man as with a woman, because nowhere in the law is there any prohibition on women being with women. Not a word. So to try to suggest that this, you know, that this one passage, well, it just means homosexuality. No, it does not. You don't understand the law. You don't understand that God, God's law was so specific. He meant every single word he said, and he meant it exactly the way he said it. You do not broaden it. You do, you know, you don't... Um, Take what he said and try to make it into something more. No, that, you'd wind up stoned over doing that, okay? So, rape of someone who is engaged, Deuteronomy 22 5, uh, through 25. Men practicing bestiality, Leviticus 20, 15. Women practicing bestiality, Leviticus 20 and 16. Uh, having intercourse with your father's wife. Now, mind you, this is distinct from having intercourse with, quote, your mother, okay? Part of that is because uh, in ancient times, men would have more than one wife. So, therefore, uh, if he had five wives and you were a son and you had intercourse with your father's wife, whether it be wife one or wife five or wife 20, uh, that was punishable by law, uh, by death, okay? Okay. Um, And that's found in Leviticus 20 and 20. Having sex with your daughter-in-law, punishable by law. Leviticus 20, 30. Incest. Isn't it funny? We never hear preachers preach on incest. Never will you hear a Southern Baptist preacher talk about incest. And yet, it is one of the laws uh, of Moses that called for the death penalty. When I teach one day on the real meaning of, um, yeah, um, fornication, it'll blow your mind because fornication is very specific and fornication includes prostitution, incest, molestation, it includes uh, bestiality, and rape, okay? So anyway, we'll, we'll go there one day as well, but for now we're going to try to stay on track. Incest, Leviticus 20, 17, punishable by law. Uh, male same-sex sexual encounters involving only one specific sexual practice was punishable 
by death. One act. This is not homosexuality, quote unquote, in the broadest sense. No, 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 no. It very specifically refers to one specific act. And I don't want to come across, you know, to uh, somebody accused me of being vulgar, but I'm going to say it so that there's no confusion. Uh, it involves anal sex, period. End of the story. That one act was the only act, the only singular act that could even remotely refer to homosexuality. And we're, we're going to look at that in more detail in the future, okay? Uh, that's Leviticus 20.13. Um, incest is Leviticus 20.17. I keep forgetting if I've given the scriptures or not. Having uh, sex with your daughter-in-law was Leviticus 20 and verse 30. Uh, sex with your father's wife was Leviticus 20 and 20. Okay, marrying a woman and her daughter. Now, do you see what I'm saying about... The, the, this is not an issue of severity. No, the, God had other reasons. It had nothing to do with severity of the act. There, was a, there were other reasons behind the Lord putting these particular offenses into a category of, uh, of uh, worthy of death, okay? So marrying a woman and her daughter... Uh, Leviticus 20, 14, worshiping idols, Exodus 20 to 20, Leviticus 21 through 5, Deuteronomy 17, 2 through 7, blasphemy, Leviticus 24, 14 through 16, as well as Leviticus 24, verse 23. Listen, breaking the Sabbath, Exodus 31, 14, Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Practicing magic, Exodus 22, 18. Being a medium or a spiritualist, Leviticus 20, 27. Trying to convert people to another religion outside of Judaism, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 11, as well as Deuteronomy 18, 20. Apostasy, Deuteronomy 13, 12 through 15. And this was, uh, in this particular law, the Lord said, if most people in a given town come to believe in a different God, you were to kill everybody, including the animals, and then burn the town. Aha! Would that explain the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, it would. Okay? Now, Giving one of your your uh, children to Molech, a, a false god, an idol, this generally refers to human sacrifice. Of course, today we don't see human sacrifice generally practiced in, in most religions that uh, are mainstream anyway. However, that is found in Leviticus 20 and 2. Non-priests going near the tabernacle, listen, when it's being moved. Numbers 151. Oh yeah, that's the most severe thing you can do, so you deserve death. No, ding -a -ling, no. Death, it has nothing to do with the quote-unquote severity of the crime, as it were. In this instance, it has to do with establishing a reverence for God. And this is why uh, when, the, um, when the Ark of the Covenant was moved, it had to be carried specifically by priests. The priests were not even, uh, they were not even allowed to touch, physically touch the Ark. They had to slide poles through these round rings that hung off the side of the ark, and they had to pick the ark up in that fashion. They weren't even allowed to touch the ark. And, and if they did, they would die. Now again, the reasons for this is, what, it's such a severe sin that you touch the ark or you touch uh, the tabernacle while it's being moved. And mind you, the tabernacle was a tent, okay? Uh, 
the whole idea was God was trying to establish a reverence and a respect for his presence and his power. The tabernacle literally represented the Lord's dwelling place. And he said, you are going to respect my dwelling place. We've got people today who have no respect for the house of God whatsoever. They come in smacking on gum. They come in carrying water bottles and Cokes and everything else. And oh, God's cool. God's funky. We don't have... I'm not saying that uh, doing this, you know, is uh, breaking any kind of law or breaking a rule. But what I am saying is... People do this oftentimes because they have no reverence for the presence of God. They have no reverence for the house of God, you know? Okay, so uh, touching the uh, tabernacle while it's being moved is Numbers 151. Uh, false prophets were to be killed, Deuteronomy uh Got to look at it more because I can't hardly read it. Deuteronomy 13.25, Deuteronomy 18.20, Zechariah 13.2-3. Striking a child, striking the parent. They were to be stoned. Exodus 21.15. Cursing your parents. Exodus 21, 17, Leviticus 20, 19. Now, remember, if, if you look at a lot of these laws, you'll actually see where they could fall under, a, um, under the heading of one of the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like a subheading, you know, uh, under the Ten Commandments. Striking your parents, cursing your parents, um, those would fall under what? Honor your father and your mother, okay? So these, these laws all fall under, you know, within the context of the Ten Commandments. Uh, cursing your parents, uh, Exodus 21, 17, Leviticus 20 and verse 9. Being a stubborn and rebellious son, uh, being a profligate and a drunkard, and that is found in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Murder. Murder. Now there's an exception here. If a slave is beaten to death, the owner is to be punished, not necessarily killed. If the slave survives the beating, then there is no punishment whatsoever. Genesis 9, 6, Exodus 21, 12, Numbers 35, 16 through 21. Uh, and this is part of a wider range of slavery laws in the Old Testament. Uh, kidnapping and selling a man. So human trafficking of a man. This, uh, this law had to do with making an Israelite, an Israelite, a slave against his will, Exodus 21, verse 16. Uh, now, who did this? Joseph's brothers, remember? They took him, they kidnapped him, they put him in a ditch, they wound up selling him into slavery. By doing so, they were literally breaking the law of Moses, and they should have been subject to death, okay? Why weren't they? Well, we'll, we'll get into that more in a minute. All right, uh, so kidnapping and selling man, Exodus 21, 16. Perjury, lying in court, serving as a witness and lying, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. Now, Deuteronomy 19, verse 20 explicitly identifies uh, the purpose of this is deterrence. In other words, the reason that you 
uh, kill a person who perjures themselves is to prevent future people from perjuring themselves. If they see what happens to somebody who perjures themselves, then they're going to be more careful not to perjure, okay? Again, what is one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbors. So do you see how these kind of fall is uh, under a, a heading within the Ten Commandments? All right. Ignoring the verdict of a judge or priest, Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 13. Not, listen to this law. This, this is worthy of death. Not putting a dangerous bull, a known dangerous bull, in a pen. If you have a bull and you know that that particular bull is dangerous and he can hurt somebody, if the bull subsequently kills a man or a woman, Exodus 21, 19 says, both the animal and the reckless owner of the dangerous bull are to be put to death. You see what I'm saying? Uh, living in a city that failed to surrender to the Israelites as they went into Canaan, okay? Um, Deuteronomy 20, 12 through 14. All right, there we go. So, that gives you an idea of the nature of the laws that called for the death penalty. There is absolutely no rhyme or reason that ties them all together. You, there's no way you can look at that list and say, well, they're all so severe. So when you have these moronic, ignorant people running around saying, well, the law says homosexuals should be killed. That. <laughs> no, not hardly. If, if at the most conservative reading of one passage, one within the law, the most conservative reading, it would have to be male-on-male -male anal intercourse. Now, here's something else that a lot of people don't understand about the law when they run around saying, oh, the Bible says, you know, these people ought to be killed. Um, how was the law, according to the Word of God, how was the law to be... Um, carried out. How was the law supposed to be um, wait a minute here folks. How was the law supposed to be um, I, I, I thought I had a note on that computer but it turns out it's not. So excuse me one quick second. Um Nope, that's, that's the, that's not what I'm looking for. Sorry about this, folks. I, I had my notes over here, but uh, here we go. Okay. So I'm going to have to use it like this then. Okay, it's, it's one thing to say that the law says, for instance, you know, the death penalty for a certain crime. But the law also tells us how that determination is to be made. Just like in American law. You know, you can say that there, the death penalty is on the table for someone who commits murder. But we have all kinds of laws, all kinds of rules of order. When you go to court, there is a, uh, there is a standard of evidence. There is a standard for the um, witnesses that the, the witnesses must meet. Was this an eyewitness? Was this hearsay? You know what I'm saying? And if it's hearsay, it's not admissible, you know? And, well, the law of Moses, folks, was the same exact way. 
there was a standard for the law. There was a standard set by which the law was carried out. So while these ignorant and foolish people run around and say, oh, homosexuals should be killed. Um, no, by a biblical standard, two witnesses at least, listen to this, two witnesses at least would have to physically observe the conduct. You could not lie in wait. You could not entrap somebody. So if you, if you suspected that Joe and Bill were engaged in some kind of gay activity, you could not barge into their home and find them in the middle of some activity and then drag them before the Sanhedrin so that they could be convicted of this activity. No, no, that was not permissible. Basically, within the law, listen carefully, you would have to commit the activity in a careless fashion so that you were observable in, in, a, in a casual environment. You say, well, what does that mean? That means, like, in, I won't put it in modern terms, that means people hanging out at a park and having sex in a park. And it's possible that somebody walking down a path or walking through the park might witness you and see you, okay? That would make it uh, possible for them to drag you before the Sanhedrin, which is the uh, Jewish court, okay? And, but, but that, would, that would only make it possible for you to even be accused, all right? Listen to this. A Sanhedrin consisted of 23 judges. Oh, wait, wait till you hear all this. You had to be convicted by a vote of at least a bare minimum of 13 judges condemning to 10 judges willing to let you go. So it, you, you had to convince 13 out of 23 judges. So you people running around saying, ow, oh, homosexuals ought to be killed. Are you prepared to drag these people in front of 23 judges and then have to present your evidence so that uh, you can convince 13 of the 23 judges. Now listen, listen. The, 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 so I said the law of Moses is a lot more complex than people realize. If by any chance all 23 of the judges come to the conclusion that you did it, listen to this. This is the mind of God. You're let go. It is assumed if all the judges come to the same conclusion, it is assumed there's something wrong with the court. Because it would be impossible to convince 23 men to all hold the same identical position on a matter. That's the way the Lord has it set up, okay? So if all 23 of the judges say, yep, he did it, kill him, uh, got to let him go. Why? Because all 23 judges agreed. And that implies there's something wrong with the court. Surely in the process you say, well, how does that work? I'll tell you how it works. Because in the process of a Jewish trial in front of the Sanhedrin, they have to begin. Listen to this now, folks. You have to begin with a presentation of that individual's positive attributes. We don't do that in America. We don't do that. But according to the law of Moses, they did. They had to have people who would testify and speak of 
this person, the good that they do, uh, their, their better quality, so on and so forth. Okay? So if you had one judge out of that uh, Sanhedrin who felt gracious and merciful toward you and decided, you know, that, well, I think this guy deserves mercy. You better have 13 judges who feel that way, okay? Because one judge, you're, you're done. Because otherwise you'd have, you know, all of them saying the same thing, all right? So, you have your witnesses come forward. Listen to this now. According to the law of Moses, the witnesses... The witnesses have to physically carry out the execution. So the people who drag you in front of the judges are the ones, the Word of God says, the Law of Moses says, they're the ones to throw the first stones. They're the ones who start the process of execution. So what do you think that did when it came to people making accusations against others? Many people wouldn't do it. Why? Because they did not feel comfortable throwing stones. They didn't feel comfortable uh, condemning someone to death, it was like, well, it's one thing to condemn them to death, it's another thing, if I have to pull the trigger, if I have to flip the switch, or if I have to pull the, uh, the, uh, the bar so that the, you know, the noose falls, um, it's one thing, you know, to make an accusation and to serve as a witness, but it's another thing to have to carry out the act of execution. So you see, God built into the law certain things that would literally make people think twice about even making an accusation. So there's a lot more mercy in the law than you realize there is. And God built this all in. So while there are people and people in the LGBT community all the time, I hear people say, well, how can you love a God who hates LGBT? He doesn't hate LGBT people any more than he hates a rebellious son or he hates a virgin who lies about her virginity. You understand what I'm saying, folks? Come on. It's not about God hating. No, there were other reasons that the Lord made certain acts, certain behaviors, a crime that was punishable by death. Now, if a witness perjured themselves in bringing an accusation against you for any crime, including crimes that were not punishable by death, listen to this, they were to be given the punishment they were trying to bring to you. So if someone perjures themselves in the process of trying to, co to convict you of homosexuality or whatever, okay, then what's going to happen is the Sanhedrin is going to determine, okay, you were trying to cause this person to be stoned to death, you're now going to be stoned to death because you lied. What does this do? This detours people from even wanting to serve as witnesses. Why? Because every word comes off their lips had better be true. And listen to this. This is so interesting. And I'm going to read some stuff to you. That will help to solidify what I'm saying in a minute. Some from Jewish websites and web, uh, Jewish sources that I've studied. Some from uh, other. But listen to this. this. This really cracks me up here. The witnesses, there have to be a minimum of two. And the witnesses have to have been able and are able to say that 
they saw one another while they were witnessing the act. So you can't have one person walking through the park at 8 o'clock and see you, and another person walking through the park at 8.10 and see you, and those two are able to bring accusation against you and serve as witnesses. No, doesn't work that way. They had to have witnessed you at the same time in so much as they were able to look across and see one another or look beside, you know, maybe there were two people traveling together, walking together, and they witnessed you, okay? This is why, folks, and I'm going to get into it more later. I don't know if I'll get to it tonight. This particular uh, portion may have to go two weeks because it's good. Th this is something most Christian people have no concept of half of what I'm talking about. Um, but this is why when the woman was dragged before Jesus and they said she was caught in the very act of adultery. Oh, really? What does that mean? Does that mean they walked into her house and found her having intercourse with a man who was married or she was married and somebody walked in and found her with another man beside her husband? No, no, because that was not permissible. She must have been doing something with a married man or she was married and doing something with another man in a location that allowed her to be found and seen by physical witnesses. However, when they dragged this woman before the Lord, most people think that, oh, they could have just stoned her on the spot. But that's not what they were doing. That that Because it didn't work that way. You couldn't just find somebody doing something and drag them out in the street and stone them. No. What they were doing was and the Word of God tells us they were testing him. They wanted to see, well, how would he react knowing that this woman and the Lord's response was, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. What's interesting is, again, who's supposed to cast the first stone to begin with? Those making the accusation, the witnesses, okay? Could this woman have been stoned in the middle of the street? No. She would have had to have gone through the process. There was a legal process to go through, okay? But again, you get Christians read this passage, and they act like, you know, oh, her life was right there in her hand because they could have stoned her in any second. No, they could not have. No, they could not have. But they were testing the Lord on a matter of laws, what they were doing, okay? And his answer baffled them. It stumped them. And they had to walk away ashamed and embarrassed because they knew he had just raised the bar. Instead of it just being the accusers, the witnesses being the first to cast the stone, he said, oh no, let's raise the bar a little bit. Let him that is without sin. So even if you're the witness, even if you're the accuser, are you without sin yourself? Have you never done anything wrong? Have you never broken Torah? You see? So that's the import of that story, okay? All right. So, um, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord before the priests and the judges. See? So you couldn't just drag them out in the middle of the street and stone them. Which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witnesses be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought, 
to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and hand for hand. Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So do you see the law immediately, right off the starting line, had a bar. You had to have a minimum of two witnesses. They had to have been physically able to look upon one another while they were witnessing the act, okay? Matthew 18, 16. We see in the New Testament how the apostles still incorporate this same principle into New Testament teaching. Uh, the Lord actually said in Matthew 18, 16, but if, he, if, if you have a brother who sins against you, he said, go to him, you know, and talk to him. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. See? So he's, he's kind of saying the concept of a minimum of two or three should also be applied in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 1, this is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses, Paul said to the Corinthians, shall every word be established. So that same standard is being pulled into the New Testament. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.19, against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Hebrews 10.28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay? Now, I'm going to read something to you. Capital punishment is a legal penalty in Israel. Capital punishment has only been imposed twice in the history of the state and is only to be handed out for treason, genocide, crimes against humanity, and crimes against the Jewish people during wartime. Israel is one of seven countries that has abolished capital punishment for quote-unquote ordinary crimes, like murder and so on and so forth. Israel inherited the mandatory Palestine, uh, Palestine Code of Law, which included capital punishment for severe crimes, but in 1954, Israel abolished the penalty for murder. The last execution was carried out in 1962. Now, the history of Jewish. This will help you to understand why they do things now the way they do things. Israel's rare use of the death penalty may be in part due to religious Judaic law. Biblical law explicitly mandates the death penalty for 36 offenses, from murder and adultery to idolatry and desecration of the Sabbath. However, in ancient Israel, the death penalty was rarely carried out. Jewish scholars since the beginning of the Common Era have developed such restrictive rules to prevent execution of the innocent that the death penalty has become de facto abolished. Moses uh, Mammonites, this is one of the ancient uh, scribes. I talked about the Torah and then the uh, Talmud and how that the Talmud is the ancient uh, writings of ancient um, rabbis and priests and what have you. And they used the Talmud with the 
uh, Torah, side by side, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to show you in a little bit here how Jesus endorsed this. So for those people who are going to try to say, well, they should bless God. And they should have used the Torah alone, bless God. You know, no, didn't work that way. Um, this man argued that executing a defendant on anything less than absolute certainty would lead to a slippery slope of decreasing burdens of proof until we would be convicting merely according to the judge's caprice. His concern was that maintaining popular respect for law, and he saw errors of commission as much more threatening than errors of omission. Conservative Jewish religious leaders and scholars believe that the death penalty should remain unused, even in extreme cases such as political assassination. Now, there's another article I want to share with you real quick. Uh, this is written by a Christian scholar who's part of an organization uh, that is called Theophil uh, Theopolis. The death penalty in ancient Israel, examining the significance of the death penalty in ancient Israel involves two aspects. First, we want to examine some details about how the death penalty actually was carried out in ancient Israel. Second, we want to ask, what is the rationale for the death penalty within the Mosaic Law? How did the death penalty function? First, the death penalty was the maximum penalty for various crimes, but it was not a mandatory penalty for most crimes. Numbers 35 is about the institution of cities of refuge for those who commit manslaughter. Verses 30 and 31 read, If anyone kills a person, the murder shall be the murderer shall be put to death at the evidence of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. This makes it clear that convicted murderers had to be executed, but also implies that the penalty in other crimes might be commuted through a ransom. that They pay a fine, basically. Probably some monetary compensation. You can look at Proverbs 6, 32-35, Matthew 1, 19. Just as God accepted the blood of a sacrificed animal, in place of the blood of the sinner, so the victim of a crime other than murder might accept a lesser penalty than death. When someone confessed to a high-handed sin, God mercifully treated the sin uh, as an inadvertent sin that could be atoned for by sacrifice. Read Numbers 5, 5, 3. So also... God's representatives, the human uh, gods, as it were, who governed Israel, meaning they were the highest, you know, the highest authority in Israel, might commute a sentence for a penitent criminal for anything other than murder. Okay? Now, secondly, the death penalty was carried out only after a trial, only through due process. Stoning was not a mob action. Although, of course, there were times when, when just like in modern times, people are, are running around doing things they shouldn't be doing. So it's not like there were times when, when the renegades ran out and stoned somebody, okay? When a manslayer came to a city of refuge, for instance, the congregation judged between the slayer and the blood avenger to determine whether or not the manslayer was a murderer. Manslayer meaning it could have been manslaughter. 
that inadvertently someone was killed. So it's, it's not really murder, it's manslaughter, okay? No one could be convicted except by the testimony of two or three witnesses, Deuteronomy 17 and 6, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. This means that the commandment to execute a man who lies with a man, for instance, in Leviticus 20, 13, isn't accurately summarized as, you shall stone all homosexuals. That both the men and the women who were convicted of adultery were executed doesn't translate to kill adulterers. Okay? Rather, it meant that someone convicted by the testimony of witnesses of committing certain acts might be executed, though again, it was not mandatory that he or she should be. The Torah certainly treated uh, certain sexual acts and criminalized them, but this crime, like every other crime, had to be proven on the testimony of two or three witnesses. One can imagine that this would be a difficult standard to meet especially with sexual crimes, okay? Now, uh, capital punishment in Judaism. Let me read this to you. Legal proceedings involving capital punishment were to be handled with extreme caution. In all cases of capital punishment in Jewish law, the judges are required to open their deliberations by pointing out the good qualities of the litigant and to bring up arguments about why he should be acquitted. Only later did they hear the incriminating evidence. It was almost impossible to inflict the death penalty because the standards of proof were so high. As a result, Convictions for capital offenses were rare, but did happen in Judaism. The standards of evidence in capital cases include, now I'm going to give you a list of, this is what Jewish law, the law of Moses, this is what was required in the course of the trial of what have you, okay? Two witnesses were required those witnesses, listen carefully, had to be adult Jewish men who were known to keep the commandments and who knew the written and oral law and had legitimate professions. Isn't that funny? In America, you can have a somebody testify against you, some drug addict off the street or some, you know, some drunk, you know, I seen him going down the road. I seen him running from the scene of crime, and I knew it was him. Well, according to the law of Moses, that was not permissible. You had to have witnesses, not only, the, again, this is why Jesus said, when they brought the woman before him, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. You had to be, the witnesses had to be of the highest moral and religious conduct. They had to be known, known to be faithful in keeping Torah. They had to have a legitimate profession. So if you were a slacker, if you were just somebody, you know, didn't uh, work working for a living, it was just laying around, honey, you could not serve as a witness. They wouldn't accept you as a witness. This alone makes conviction difficult, right? But listen, the witnesses had to see each other at the time of the sin. The witnesses had to be able to speak clearly without any speech impediment or hearing deficit. What? You don't have witnesses who are deaf and they have a sign language interpreter in the court? 
You don't have witnesses who are blind, who are sitting in court telling what they heard? No. Not permissible. The witnesses could not be related to each other. Nor could they be related to the accused. <laughs> oh my goodness. So when your family member comes along and says, Well, bless God, homosexuals should be killed, bless God. That's what the law of God says. Go over to God, hallelujah. Well, buddy, you're not qualified to bring the accusation. Got news for you. We're related. Listen. The witnesses had to see each other and both of them had to give a warning to the person that the sin they were about to commit was a capital offense. The warning had to be delivered within seconds of the performance of the sin. And here's how that was judged. If they were committing a sin the warning had to be spoken within the amount of time it would take to say, Peace unto you, my rabbi and my master. That's the standard. In the same amount of time, the person about to sin had to both respond that she or he was familiar with the punishment, but they were going to do the sin anyway and begin to commit the sin or the crime. So if you saw somebody about to do something, you had to warn them, what you're about to do carries the death penalty. And then that person has to say, yeah, I know, I'm going to do it anyway. Now mind you, most people, if they get caught in the act and somebody you know could drag you into court and potentially, ultimately, cost you your life, what are you going to do if you're caught in the act and somebody, you're going to stop? It doesn't mean you're never going to do it. It just means you ain't going to do it there. You're not going to do it right now. You might tell the truth. So do you see how restricted the law of Moses was? All right. However... If the accused has already committed the crime, the accused would have been given a chance to repent, according to Ezekiel 18.27. And if they repeated the same crime or any other, it would lead to a death sentence. If witnesses were caught lying about the crime, they would be executed. The Beth Din, or the rabbinical court, had to examine each witness separately. Listen. And if even one minor point of their evidence, such as eye color, was contradictory, the evidence was considered contradictory, and the evidence was not heeded. The Beth Din had to consist of a minimum, minimum of 23 judges. The majority could not be a simple majority. The split verdict that would allow conviction had to be at least 13 to 10 in favor of conviction. If Beth Din arrived at a unanimous verdict of guilt, the person was let go. The idea being that if no judge could find anything exculpatory about the accused, there was something wrong with the court. The witnesses were appointed by the court to be the executioners. That is how the law was carried out. So when you hear idiot people, you know, I oh, want these people, I'll be killed. These people. No, this is what would be required before anybody could be touched with capital punishment. Now, there is a website that I've used many times in research over the years called My Jewish Learning. 
Uh, it has a number of rabbis and teachers and people that write some wonderful articles. Uh, there's a article there on the Torah and Capital Punishment by uh, Sam Shankoff. Let me read this to you. Parashat Shafim, however, reflects a more complex perspective. Although our Torah portion affirms the use of capital punishment, a deep ambivalence surfaces in the description of biblical executions. Let the hands of the witnesses be the first against him to be put to death, and the hands of the rest of the nation thereafter. That's found in Deuteronomy 17 and 7. The requirement that the witnesses whose testimony condemned the criminal to death throw the first stones forces them to consider whether they are prepared to bear the responsibility of extinguishing a life. And the community's participation ensures that all Israelites share this responsibility. Blood shall be on everyone's hands. No one may grow numb to capital punishment. You see, here in America, we got people, you ask them about capital punishment. Oh, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. You know, what if you were the one who was sitting there? in the execution chamber and you had to turn on the needles or you had to flip the switch for the electric chair. Or you might, you know, in your stupidity, you might think, oh, I can do it, bless God. Yeah. Let me tell you something. There, there, there are men a whole lot harder than you are in their heart who have done that kind of work and it takes its toll and they can't do it but once or twice because it literally is just it is too difficult on them emotionally and psychologically to know that they are responsible for the taking of a human life okay the ambivalence deepens in the Talmud. Remember the Torah and the Talmud. The Talmud is the ancient teaching of the rabbis, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I call it, for lack of better uh, phraseology, a commentary, but in, in effect it's, it's much weightier than that. The rabbis effectively abolish capital punishment in the Tal Talmud, primarily on the grounds that the human justice systems are fallible and that executing wrongly convicted individuals is unaccepted. The death penalty should be left in the hands of God, so to speak. And you can read that in Sanhedrin 37 A and B and Kedobot 30 A and B. That's from the, the Talmud. For, every, for anyone who might suggest that the Talmudic writings should not be considered when studying the Mosaic law. It should be pointed out some, it should be pointed out that the Lord himself said, listen, Matthew 23, 1 through 3, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do. Say, well, okay, what does that mean? That means Jesus knows that the scribes and Pharisees get their instruction not merely from reading the Torah and interpreting it any old way they want to. No, they get it from the Torah and the Talmud. And they develop uh, laws and rules and ways of doing things based on the Talmud. He said, whatever they instruct you, however they tell you to do it. So what's he say? They tell you that this is how a trial is to be carried out, so do it that way. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now... Many people probably have not even considered this, but uh, 
when you read the New Testament, there are many references to the Talmud, not the Torah, the Talmud. And some of you might be saying, what? what are you talking about? There's references to the Torah. Every time you read the phrase, I love doing this. I'm going to build a little suspense. Every time you read the phrase, ye have heard it said. Notice the Lord didn't say it has been written or, you know, uh, uh, or anything that refers to the law of the Torah. He would say uh, it is written. Like when he was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he'd say, it is written, thou shalt, and he would quote Torah. He would quote the Old Testament, right? Matthew 5, 21, listen. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. And then, of course, he went on to offer his own thoughts on the matter. There were times when the Lord went somewhere in interpreting law that the Talmud didn't. He had a different approach. He had a different way. For instance, uh, you have heard it said in Matthew 5.27, you have heard that it was said by them of old time. Again, you hear the phraseology? You have heard it was said of them by of old time. So this is not him quoting Torah. This is not him quoting the Bible. No, he's quoting the Talmud. He's saying, the ancient rabbis have said, this isn't the word of God. I'm not saying, you know, it is written. No, this is the Talmud. Matthew 5.33, again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Matthew 5.38, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Matthew 5.43, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Okay? So now you have a better understanding of certain stories even within the New Testament. When you understand what I'm talking about tonight concerning the law and how it was to be carried out and all of this, all of a sudden now we have a better understanding of the story where the woman is caught in the act of adultery, John 8, 1 through 11. Jesus went up into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? So they're not saying we're taking her out to stone her. Okay? Then they, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. So do you see? The word of God tells us, but this is where uh, evangelicals and fundamentalists and a lot of Christians are so careless in the handling of God's word. They act like, oh, they were dragging this woman out to stone her. No, no, no. They dragged her before the Lord strictly to test him and to see what his response might be. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, 
He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go. He's not telling her, Go and don't commit any sin under the sun. No, he's saying, Go and don't do this again. Okay? In this story, we see a woman being dragged before Jesus with the claim that she had been caught in the very act of adultery. Now, the interesting thing about this story is, where was the man? According to the law, both the man and the woman were to share in the punishment. They were both to be stoned. Where was the man? See, they dragged the woman before the Lord, but the fellow was nowhere to be found. Seeing as the law did not permit one to lie in wait or to entrap a person in a sinful act, the implication is that she and her sexual partner committed this act uh, in some location that made it possible for others to happen upon them. In modern times, you might it be like a romantic interlude in a public park or even in a parked car. And maybe... You know, you're in a drive-in drive theater. To, some of you kids are too young to know what that is. Or, you know, you're at some park somewhere parking, you know. Or you're up at, uh, what do they call it, you know, Sunset Hill where the kids go to park, you know. And somebody walks by your car, looks in, and sees it happening, okay. Uh, had they been more discreet, it would not have been possible for them to have been found out. The law required that the prohibited act be witnessed. The law was not punishable based upon circumstantial evidence, listen to this, or even outright confession. I remember when I read this in my studies in, of the uh, Jewish writers were writing about it. They said, if you walked out of your house I'm a homosexual, I'm a homosexual, I sleep with men, I sleep with men. Couldn't do a thing in the world to you. Didn't matter how many people heard you say it, didn't matter how many people saw you, didn't matter. Because an outright confession was not able to be brought to court. You had to be caught in the act, period. That was the only way that the matter could be litigated. Now, the Lord, he raised the bar. He suggested that the first to throw stones should be those who were without sin and not merely those who actually witnessed the act. Because of God's mandate that the actual witnesses be the first to carry out the death penalty, it was incumbent upon any witnesses to examine their own heart first in order to determine if they could even be capable of initiating the extinguishing of a human life before bringing, bringing the offense to the attention of the courts. So, in this requirement, the Lord God builds into the law an element of mercy and contemplation. Matthew 22, I'm actually almost done, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this tonight. Uh, I've been talking like a, a jackhammer, so I'm trying to get through this. I was hoping I could do this section in one setting. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When I was studying some Jewish teaching concerning the law and the carrying out of the law, what was really, really interesting to me was uh, 
the fact that this is considered within Jewish teaching to be the greatest law. So when Jesus said this, he was not saying something they hadn't already heard. And because this is considered to be the greatest commandment, as it were, within the law, the rabbis, the ancient rabbis, the Talmud says, uh, this needs to be applied when a witness witnesses a sin or witnesses a crime. you got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. How would you want someone to respond if they caught you doing something? Would they want you to exercise mercy, to turn the other way, to ignore, to act as though they hadn't seen it? You follow? Because it, nowhere is there a mandate within the law that a witness had to come. The Jehovah's and the Mormons, they have their little rules and regulations. If you see one of our members doing something that we say they shouldn't be doing, you have to come and report it to the elders. Right, Booby? That's not how the law worked. The law said, no, 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 no. The greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And therefore, as Jesus said, whatsoever you would, the men should do unto you, do even so unto them. So you ought to look at every circumstance and every situation as you would wish if you were in that situation, you know, others would look at you. <clears throat> so what happens is, again, we read all these, all these, if this happens, kill them. If that happens, kill them. If that happens, kill them. But what we're not realizing is God did that for a reason. Not so all these people would be killed. No. These things are in place so that every time you come upon one of these situations, one of these circumstances... You have to do a little self-examination. You have to contemplate whether you are comfortable being judgmental and condemnatory and criticizing and bringing accusation and going through, because you're going to have to serve as a witness in the court. <coughs> and again, your testimony is going to have to line up with at least one other witness and it's got to be identical if you say the guy's eyes were brown and the other guy said, I think his eyes were blue, then, honey, they throw that evidence out. Do you follow? So what was God really doing with all these laws that call for the death penalty? What he's really doing is he's trying to teach us mercy. He's trying to teach us grace. But you see, we don't see that because we're so busy Fundamentalists and evangelicals are so busy reading the words. They don't understand any of the context. They don't understand. They don't look at, they look at the law, just like you'd look at a law that says, for instance, in the state of Texas, if, if a man murders somebody, you know, uh, they should be killed. Well, first of all, if, in, in modern times, the death penalty is on the books as a rule. It's not mandatory. You know, it's, it's just available to the prosecutor. So we don't even have laws that simply say, if you do this, you must be killed. But for the sake of argument, let's say such a law existed, okay? If this person does this, they must be killed. Um, but when you apply all the standards of the trial to the situation, then it all boils down to the witness, the person who actually sees it. Are they going to be merciful or are they going to choose judgment? Now, the ancient Jewish Talmud taught that the rule of Matthew 23, 36 through 40, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, that this rule be applied to all laws, even those in which the death penalty was called for. 
For this reason, mercy was extended far, 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 far more often than the death penalty was actually meted out. James 2.13 tells us, For he, God, shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. What does he say? He says, God is going to judge those without mercy who have showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth, listen to the language of James, mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So what is the opposite of mercy? Judgment. So we got people want to run around judging people, want to run around condemning people, want to run around criticizing people, want to run around calling fire down from heaven on people's heads. And God says, oh boy, you don't know the mess you're going to unleash on yourself when you stand before me in the judgment because I will have judgment without mercy on him that hath showed no mercy. Oh my goodness, does that change things, folks? Are you understanding this? Oh, I hope, I hope LGBT people out there are listening to me. If I have to say it myself, I'll say it. This is good teaching. I'm going to finish this real quick. Shouldn't take but an extra five, ten minutes tops. Luke 9, 51 through 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he, that he should be received up meaning Jesus, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So the Lord was passing through Samaria. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get along well. When the Samaritans in a village he was about to reach, uh, he sent a couple of his men ahead to make arrangements for them to stay the night somewhere. Nobody would give them uh, a room. Nobody would offer them a place to stay or allow them to stay. Because the Lord was headed for Jerusalem. Okay? Okay. So his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, came back to him. And they're like, well, Lord, they're committing, listen to me carefully, they're committing the sin of inhospitality. They're not extending hospitality. According to the law, they should extend hospitality even to a stranger, someone not of the same nationality. Therefore, should we call down fire from heaven like was poured down upon where? Sodom and Gomorrah. For what? Hospitality. Same identical situation. Same identical circumstances. Should we call down fire like Elijah did? And how does the Lord respond? He rebukes them. Because God's not looking to destroy people. He's not looking, you know, those of you who've been convinced that God's in heaven just beating people over the head for every little thing. Honey, I got news for you. You've been taught a false message. You are believing a lie. That is not our God at all. In the instance of this story, the apostles were literally asking the Lord if the same fate ought not to be visited upon this inhospitable Samaritan city, even as it had been rained down upon Sodom for the exact same sin. 
They referenced the manner with which Elijah called down fire from heaven as a means of suggesting that they too had such power to call down fire from heaven. Notice the Lord's stern rebuke in response to their suggestion. In it, he states, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Clearly implying their spirit is not in harmony with God's spirit. Their swift desire and willingness to rain down judgment and death upon the Samaritans was very telling. It made it abundantly clear that these brothers had no clue as to the mission of Jesus and that they were certainly out of step with the nature and manner of the Spirit of God. Got news for you, honey. All these ignoramuses running around. Homosexuals ought to be killed. First of all, they're dumb as a brick, so you, you just don't even need to worry about that, number one. Number two, they are operating under the influence of a demonic spirit because that spirit is not in harmony with God's spirit. Because he will have judgment without mercy upon him that showed no mercy. Do you follow me tonight? Amen. All right. I think we made it through this section. I thought maybe this would be good um, tonight before we go into the passages that reference the death penalty. This way... Uh, instead of doing it, I was going to do it afterwards, you know, but instead, you know, as we read those passages now, you'll have a much better understanding of the standard that would be required, you know, uh, for a conviction, so on and so forth. And therefore, as we read those passages now, you've got a clear understanding of the law, the nature of the law, the purpose of the law. You've got a clear understanding of how the law is carried out and why these punishments are uh, meted out. But at the same time, how the Jewish people were commanded and taught to... Uh, carried these things out. You know, was, was it just arbitrarily done at the drop of a hat? Not by a million miles. Nope. There was all kinds of opportunity throughout the entire process for mercy. There, there was opportunity for repentance. There was opportunity, frankly, to just stop what you were doing for the time being and get your butt out of where, you know, out of where you were at. I mean, literally, the law was not this black and white, cut and dry, that so many evangelicals and fundamentalists try to paint it as being. If it were, quite honestly, the nation of Israel wouldn't exist today. <laughs> they'd, have been, they'd have been wiped out uh, over the course of the centuries. They'd have been completely and utterly wiped out, and nobody would remain. The same way, in fact, that, uh, like I tell people all the time, um, the Word of God teaches if we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. And that was the Apostle John speaking to the church, not speaking to sinners, speaking to the church. Because the truth is, as the Apostle Paul said, he said, with my body I serve the law of sin, but with my mind I serve the law of Christ. The reality is sin is something we will reckon with. It is something that will be part of our existence up until the day we are redeemed and we are caught away and taken up into glory, resurrected by the power and glory of God, and we are changed from that which is corruptible to that which is incorruptible. But until then, sin is a constant reality, something we, we have to reckon with. And God calls us all to be people of mercy, to be people of grace. That's why he said, that's why Jesus said, Judge not, lest you be judged. Because the same way you judge is the manner by which you're going to be judged. I'm going to tell you, a lot of Christians just don't get it. Just don't get it. 
All right, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this. If I might say so myself, I think we are in a marvelous track. I, I think this was terrific tonight. I love sharing this information with people because having grown up in a fundamentalist church myself, I know that 98% of what I heard tonight, I never heard in my life before. I know that for a fact. And I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. Nobody, nobody talks about any of this. And what a disservice we do. What a disservice we do to the Word of God when we, when we are not diligent and we're not careful and thoughtful in how we approach our study. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Master, we are so grateful, God, for tonight. What a wonderful time basking in the glory of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the call for the death penalty in the law for so many offenses. Why do I say thankful? Thank you, Lord. I say thank you because, Lord, this is a call for each and every one of us. When looking upon another who might commit an offense that otherwise would be worthy of death, and that includes the believer looking simply at the unbeliever, the sinner. Instead of looking at them with judgment and condemnation, we ought to be looking at them with grace and mercy. Master, today, I pray, God, that every person who has listened and heard this study, those who will watch later and who will hear this word, I pray, God, that you will set this on fire in their spirit. Burn it into their soul today, God, so that they will clearly understand the true message that you mean to convey when you established the penalty of death for so many offenses within the law. And help us, Lord, to understand that you designed this thing to work in such a way that there was multiple opportunity for mercy, multiple opportunity for grace. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would keep your hand upon all your people today. The word of God promises the angels of the Lord encamp around about them that fear him. And Lord, we live in a dangerous time. So much anger and angst and violence in our world today. Keep your people safe. Keep your children safe, Master, in the name of Jesus. Go with us from this place. Keep us in your care. Bring us together once again at the appointed time. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I appreciate your coming to be with us today. I did take a few extra minutes. I hope that was okay. Um, I hope you'll come be with us Sunday at uh, 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. If you live in Huntsville, folks, come on now. We need people to get involved. We're trying to do something wonderful and positive and historic and powerful in the city of Huntsville. And we need people. I can't do this by myself, folks. We cannot establish a church that is being a blessing to our world and is bringing this powerful, wonderful, uh, clear and concise teaching. We can't do this by ourselves. We need people. I don't care if you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or, or bow-legged. doesn't matter at all. This church is for every believer who believes in a progressive approach to uh, Christianity. And by progressive, I mean looking at issues that need to be re-examined. And if we need to change the way we do things, then we're going to change the way we do things. Because God has called us to move forward. He's called us to progress, to grow, to mature day by day. And the church is called to make this progress as well. So come be with us Sunday, 3322 Memorial Parkway, suite number 537, Huntsville, Alabama, 
35801. We're on the second floor. Uh, if you have mobility issues, you're able to, to go into the parking lot at the back of the buildings, and there is a ramp that goes straight across to the second floor from that back parking lot if you have mobility issues. Otherwise, you can park down below and walk up the stairs one flight. Uh, I hope you'll also come be with us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time for another midweek Bible study as we continue our series, LGBT Affirming Theology. In the meantime, we love you, we appreciate you, and God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.